Hello, and welcome to Wealth Matters, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. This show is presented to you by Gaslowitz Frankel, a law firm dedicated to resolving disputes involving your wealth, whether through your will, your trust, your business, or your investments. For news, pictures, and tips, go to our new website at gaslowitzfrankel.com or follow us on Twitter at a state dispute. Our show's has- hashtag is Wealth Matters. Your hosts today are myself, Robert Port, and my partner, Craig Frankel, and today we're talking about financial and estate planning for young adults. So now let's start and introduce our guests, and I'll start with my left, which means nothing to our listeners. Allison, tell us who you are and what you do. Hi, Craig. Thanks for the introduction. I'm Allison McLeod with Atlanta Tax. I uh, manage taxes for people who care about their money. And Chloe, tell us about yourself. Yes, my name is Chloe Moore. I I have a firm, Financial Staples, uh, based in Atlanta, but I serve clients nationwide, and I work with young professionals on comprehensive financial planning. And Cherish, last but not least. My name is Cherish De La Cruz. I have my own um, estate planning and business planning law firm, and I help young families and small businesses. Okay, so we started off, and today's uh, topic talks about uh, estate planning for young adults. So I think the real first question for each of you is, what do you define as a young adult? You're, you're looking at me, Craig. This is Allison. So uh, young adult, uh, anybody younger than I am, whatever my current age is? Um, you know, I, I think of probably- 14? <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, mid-30s, younger. Is that what you're looking at, Cherish? Yes, generally, um, I would say 20, maybe 25 to 34 for me. Chloe, the same? Yeah, I'd actually define young professionals as 30s and 40s. Okay. Okay, so if, if that's the case, whatever the, the demographic is, why, why does financial planning and estate planning for that cohort matter? They're young. Uh, I, I still remember those days. You think you're never going to die. Your family knows what you want. You may be single. Why does it matter? Let's, let's start with you, Cherish. For me, um, working with younger clients, I have seen what happens when people don't plan. So um, most recently, um, you know, I I have a a client who's now a widow. They were high income earners. The uh, father was a breadwinner and he died unexpectedly. He was very, very young. He was 32 years old, Mm -hmm. had a two year old son and a, a young wife. Um, He was the breadwinner of the family, and now, because nothing was put in place, he, his family, you know, is at a loss, and so it's a scavenger hunt, it's trying to figure out what the assets are, doing a guardianship, and I mean, a conservatorship for the financial assets, so seeing what happens when people don't plan. And and I should mention, just for for our listeners, if you have a sudden death, that is the worst, that is the most difficult time for the survivors to think rationally. You want them to use that time to grieve and take care of their loved ones. And thinking about the numbers is really just difficult. And Chloe, uh, why why does financial planning matter? However you describe financial planning for for that age cohort. Yes, I I think financial planning is important uh, to start as early as possible. Um, and it, we, we had a couple of discussions, you know, before, before we started, but, um, you know, just thinking about as you're getting older and getting closer to retirement, um, what would you have paid or what would you have, you know, given up, given up to, to be able to do financial planning earlier and put yourself in a better position for retirement? Um, so a lot of people, you know, they just think that they're going to live forever, like you said, and, and that they're, you know, they're just, they have so much time on their hands um, to, to really think about planning later on, but the earlier you start, the better. So ask your parents what they wish they did. Don't ask them what they did. Right, and, right. and what, what I've realized looking back is that time uh, is, is on your side, particularly with financial planning, and the value of accumulating money and let it compound over time. And the way it was illustrated to me uh, was I, I heard somebody once ask the question, when's the best time to plant a shade tree 20 years ago? When's the second best time today? Exactly. And that's, for me, that sort of brought home how to do it. So, Allison, why is, you're, you're the CPA here, why is, uh, you know, most people think about taxes and that kind of stuff and just, you know, 
get ill? Why, why, should, <laughs> why, why should that be something young professionals uh, focus on? That's a really good question, and it plays into everything that everybody's just been saying, is that taxes are pretty much the biggest expense for anyone. It's not your housing, I promise, it's your taxes. So if you're starting out, uh, you know, in your 20s, 30s, or even 40s, thank you, Chloe, for that generous thought that people in their 40s are young professionals. That makes me a young professional. Uh, Taxes being your biggest expense, if you can cut that down early on, then that time horizon that you have to invest and uh, grow your money, grow your wealth over time, then that base just increases. So whether that's if you're a C-level employee and you're getting uh, stock options, things like that from your company, or you're starting a business and you want to know the best way to structure that from a tax perspective, getting those good answers early on just sets you up for success going forward. And I want to note something. So I, 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 work, I serve on a lot of boards for charities, and I'm looking at the 401ks or the 403bs where you get to save money in a retirement account. And many of them will match the, the contributions, but I have found that most employees, particularly young employees, don't take advantage of that. And when we're looking at tax savings, given the new tax laws, it seems to me that there aren't a whole lot of tax savings you can do as a young person. Are you finding, um, Allison, that that young people are taking advantage of 401ks or that is a good vehicle or what? I find some people do and some people don't. Firstly, it's a cash flow issue and really pretty much anything that anybody here in this room is doing all comes back to cash flow. So for some folks that are first starting out, they really don't have the funds to be investing. Uh, I'll be straight up honest. They, you know, if, if someone comes to me and they have a lot of issues, probably one of the first issues I would say, especially if they have children, is do you have an estate plan in place? Have you gone to see an estate attorney? You know, spend a few thousand dollars on that before you put that in your 401k because if you croak tomorrow, you want to make sure that your kid's don't go somewhere that the state has decided. So there's kind of, you know, a hierarchy of financial planning, which Chloe and Cherish can talk a lot more about. Uh, But back to your question, Craig, about whether people are putting money in these 401ks. Most of my clients, um, and sort of self-fulfilling prophecy because if folks don't have the funds, generally they're they're not coming to me as clients. But, um, so I guess that's really more confirmation bias, but most of them are putting into their 401ks but probably a lot of them are only doing it up to the point they get that employer match because that is free money and that is definitely a good thing Um, i think with a lot of folks and i think chloe can talk more about this it's a question of do they want to put it in a regular 401k or a roth 401k i see the roth iras being very very popular with young young people they seem to they seem to be all over that and with tax rates as low as they are these days that's really not a bad idea so the, the long answer, <laughs> the short answer to that long answer is really, it, it depends. So um, Allison mentioned something about cash flow. And Chloe, I, I know we, we asked you to give us some thoughts before we started. And number one for you is cash flow. So tell our listeners a little bit how you approach that. You know, they, they get their income, a paycheck. If they're lucky, they may get money from a trust or other uh, regular distributions, maybe a family business. Yeah, trust you, me, most don't. <laughs> <laughs> how, do, how does one uh, who, who uh, how, does, how do you go about sort of helping people deal with their cash flow? Definitely. The first step is really just having awareness of, of what's coming in and what's going out. Uh, when I work with a lot, of, a lot of my clients, they have no clue how much they spend in any given month. Uh, and, and where that money's really going. So, so that's one of the first things I do with them is help them come up with a, a, a budget I mean, figure out, okay, what, what's really going out. Are there internet tools or things that can help us? Because I've got kids in their 20s, and knowing where their money goes is shocking that they know nothing. Yes. So, so are there tools that you could at least direct yeah. kids to, kids, young adults to start off with to get a better awareness? Yes, there, there's a, a lot of online tools. Um, some of the most popular ones are, are Mint. Um, mint.com and then also you need a budget as a good budgeting tool uh, that some of my clients use as well uh, but yeah there's a lot of a lot of tools some people like to just use good old excel and you know download transactions and, and kind of categorize and see where things are going so so tell i'm not not that we're advocating anything in particular but t- tell our listeners a little bit about how those programs work i i use mint i've tried to get my my sons to use it and I find it very helpful because if you link up and what you do is you go in, you link your accounts, you link your investments, 
and it will regularly report to you what's going on and you can start to get a sense of as you say where things are going what your bills are how your investments are hopefully increasing over time yes mint mint is a great tool to basically just upload all of your transactions um based off of your you know your bank accounts and link everything together and so you can then categorize your transactions and, and kind of see where things are going in different categories. You can set budgets for yourself and receive alerts if you go over your, you know, your, like your eating out budget, as, as an example. Um, so it's a great tool to kind of see where you are based on, you know, and, and compare that to where you want to be you know, in different categories. My daughter found out that she was spending 20% of her social budget on coffee. <laughs> I, I, I'm not joking. It was a shocking number to her. It didn't shock me. Yeah. <laughs> Cherish, tell me, if someone came to you and we're talking about estate planning, what's the first kind of tool they should look at? What's the most important thing? And let's talk about a young person who doesn't have children versus a young person perhaps who's married or does have children. Okay. So um, typically, and this is what I recommend to parents who have children going off to college, um, so part of the reason why I say you should have your parents, if, if, if they're in college, set up or you know, help you pay for an advanced health care directive. Um, once you turn 18, um, your parents don't have access to your medical records. So if you're at the hospital and um, you, know, you need your parents to make your medical decisions for you or somebody else that you trust, you need to have an advanced health care directive. And, and let's be clear on this because I've seen a lot on, on, on different websites. Is there a difference between like a medical authorization or a release and an advanced directive? Um, yes. So there's a HIPAA release, which allows you to get medical records. So if your parents, let's say you went to UGA um, and you're off to college and they needed to get your medical records because they need to transfer you to a hospital, your parents would be allowed to get your medical records at the UGA Medical Center. Um, and then um, an advanced health care di uh, directive also allows you to also um, change um, to nominate someone to make your health care decisions. So, you know, God forbid, you know, your student, um, your child uh, gets into a car accident and your parents need to make medical decisions for you. Um, they can. They'll have the authorization to do that as well, too. And is that different from a lot of folks come to us and say in, in a different context, well, I've got power of attorney. Mm hmm. Yes. So then there's also the financial power of attorney. So, um, you know, college student, um, you know, Michael, he goes to college and he opens up his bank account. But parents need to know, OK, Michael is running his rent and all of his expenses through the bank account. But parents don't know what needs to be paid for. So, you know, if Michael got into a car accident um, and they needed to pay his rent and his parents didn't know what his rent the bank is not going to allow the parents to get access that in, for that information. And, and by the way, on the new uh, rules regarding access to social media or access to bank accounts, people ignore and always say, I accept the, the terms of agreement. Within the privacy rules, you can give access or limited access or conditional access to somebody for those types of situations, but you have to choose it. Okay. Yes. And yeah. And while we're talking, Cherish, about um, situations involving young people, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about the issues that arise with digital access after someone passes. This is, my sense is, a brave new world, and you know the Googles and the Facebooks and the Instagrams of the world are trying to figure out how to deal with it, and you, as a planner, are trying to figure out how to deal with it. Well, the, the, there's a new power of attorney um, in, in Georgia that was implemented about two years ago, and so that allows for digital access. Um, however, there is a difference um, in, in, in trying to reach Google and get those accounts. Um, you know, there's a practical. So, you know, you've got the law, then you've got the practical matters and actually accessing that information. But it does help to have, you know, digital access and uh, authorization for people to actually access your accounts. So also like your bank accounts, um, you know, going online, uh, your social media profiles. Um, and then, you know, if somebody is, you know, a gamer and they've accumulated all of these, um, I think they're coins or money, but there's an actual value for 
you know, playing these video games, that actually has an estate value. There's there's a value. There's associated. value to playing. I'm sorry, what? Yes, yes. <laughs> Surprisingly, yes. And so um, there is a certain amount of value, and you know, you have to decide who you want to pass that on to. You wouldn't think that, but now you know, YouTube. Um, you know, they have these arenas now with YouTube gamers, and thousands and thousands of people will watch them. And so, just as the digital, I mean, as society is changing and we're having more digital access to um, things, then you know, you've got to think about and plan for those things as well, too. So, um, Cherish uh, was referring to things that are digital. It made me think of cryptocurrencies. Um, Allison, any any thoughts on how that plays into the tax work you do and whatever advice you give folks about that? I think what he's saying is, will you get caught? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will. And that's, that's fairly recent. Um, not all countries are approaching this the same way, but in the U.S., uh, the IRS has said that uh, digital currencies are treated like a lot of other uh, capital assets. So if you, um, you know, buy Bitcoin at 100 U.S. dollars and Bitcoin then later sells for 1,000 U.S. dollars uh, and you sell one Bitcoin, you have a $900 capital gain. Uh, and it's short term, long term, depending on how long you held the, the coin. Uh, and that the IRS is expecting to see that. And they have reports from some of these major traders so that uh, there are the, the uh, cryptocurrency platforms. So they're, they're seeing who has ownership. Uh, do they get 10, 1099s like a normal sale or something else? I don't believe they're they're necessarily across the board getting those, but there are some uh, platforms out there that are starting to issue those, um, and they're starting to issue them in um, ways that are somewhat friendly to be able to be reported on your tax return. Um, in probably the last year or so, maybe before that, if you were getting any kind of reporting, it's probably more like a download of transactions. Um, I, I got a few of those from clients this past year, and you know, they're micro transactions basically. So you you it's almost like day trading um, I, you know there may be um, something to go along with your return that has you know hundreds of pages of transactions and you basically get to gain or loss that's you know 200 US dollars so uh, but the IRS is, is figuring it out um, and they're like yeah yeah if, if your name's on this list at some point we're expecting to see some transactions you're not holding this indefinitely we know you're gonna sell it so um, but you know I am finding for most of my clients that hold uh, digital currencies the actual impact to their tax returns is generally pretty nominal um, I think that would certainly change if you had Bitcoin that's you know five years old or something like that but you're listening to Wealth Matters the radio show where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth we are your hosts, Robert Port and Craig Frankel from the fiduciary litigation law firm of Gas Lewis Frankel. We are talking with Chloe Moore, CFP, Principal and CEO of Financial Staples, Cherish Dela Cruz, attorney and partner with Dela Cruz Law LLC, and Allison McLeod, CPA, CFP at Atlanta Tax. And we are talking today about financial and estate planning for young adults. Now, Cherish, I'm going to ask you the second question. So first, you said, what happens when your kid goes to college? And you said, let's make sure that they're protected for both access to their money if there's a problem and for medical. Now let's shoot ahead a little and you're thinking about getting married. And I don't mean you personally, a, a young adult is thinking about getting married. Are there different considerations? Yes, there are different considerations. So um, you want to do the planning for your spouse. And so definitely you want to have at least a wills based plan, which means that you're um, creating a will and leaving, you know, if you if you wish, um, everything to your, your spouse. Um, some people, they will, you know, forget to update their beneficiary designations um, for their spouse. And so they'll forget to put their wife's name. So they'll have a 401k, um, and you know to check it regularly so that that's something that you definitely have to do I've seen situations in my practice where they think that they've put their um, their spouse's name on the beneficiary like their life insurance um, their um, uh, 401k and they haven't or you know that provider changed um, uh, third-party services and th it, it defaulted back to the estate one of the reasons why you want to do that is because um, there's a priority of creditors. 
that get paid after somebody passes away. And so if there's a lot of debt, you have to kind of think about that. But that's more on what Chloe would. Yeah. Well, we would hope young people don't experience this, but what we often see in our practice is a failure to change a beneficiary designation. And then the ex-spouse dies, and he's never he or she's never changed the beneficiary right. designation, so that the ex-spouse gets sometimes hundreds of thousands or more dollars. Chloe, so, let, let let's talk about the debt because I think it's it's clear we are not in the old society where your husband or your spouse's debt or your parents' debt are yours. So if you're young and you're building up debt, let's say oh for example college education debt. If you leave money in your estate, it's going to go to pay off that debt. Whereas if you use a beneficiary designation of whatever the asset is, life insurance, it won't. So when you're talking to young people, what do you tell them about management of debt? Yes, for young professionals, I think some of the, the most common forms of debt um, are student loans. And that, that's something that you know, has a big, a big impact on, on their ability to save um, for their future. <laughs> And, and so I help a lot of clients with student loans and, um, and just managing that debt. I know with federal, with federal student loans, um, those are forgiven at your death. Um, if you have private student loans, then, then yes, that affects your estate. And the reason I ask the question, we see a lot of TV commercials about how you can consolidate the debt and get a lower number. I think a lot of our listeners don't realize you're taking it out of the federal rubric and the protections and you're now getting a private loan. Yes. And, and so you're changing all the protections. I'm not sure people realize that. Yeah, yes, that's something that people definitely you know, make mistakes on when it comes to consolidating uh, student loans or, um, or refinancing student loans. So, um, so that's something that I work with clients on as well to just you know, look at the situation. What, what type of employment do they have? Are they at a nonprofit or working for a nonprofit? Um, are there opportunities for forgiveness? Um, and then if not, you know, what can we do? What's the best option for paying down, down that debt? Let's, let's circle back a little bit to uh, newly married folks. Um, Chloe, how do you suggest, and there's no singular way to do this, but how do you suggest that they merge their finances or deal with their finances going forward? Yes, I, for most people, I think the, e the easiest way is to have a joint account to cover the household expenses, and then each spouse have a separate account to cover some of their personal expenses. Uh, and then maybe just have if on the joint side if they have an agreement to say if we spend more than x amount of dollars then we'll consult with each other about about that expense um, for the household cherish on, on that issue uh, families people that get married um, come from different places in their lives so they may come from a wealthier family or they may have the op they may have the opportunity or something to inherit wealth i see a lot of young people going ahead and merging their assets, kind of putting it in the same bucket, whether it be an investment account, but most often buying a house together using what I would refer to as inheritance or family money and without making any distinctions. Is that a good idea? No, um, it, it isn't a good idea. And so, you know, sometimes when you have uh, wealthier families, they will put their um, children's assets in trust for them. And then what I have seen from my own practice is they will take assets from that trust and they will um, put it in you know, their, their joint bank account. So once it comes from protected money, then to um, mixed money. Let's just think of it that way. And then you know, what happens if somebody gets divorced? Um, you know, you, you know, you're, you're, you're young, you're married now, but, you know, 10, 15 years from now, you, you, you know, you're contemplating divorce. And by the way, the divorce rates are interesting. For young people, it's going down. It's below 40 percent. But for people over the age of 50 whose children are going to college, it's going up. Mm. So the, the, the blended divorce rate right, right now is still around 50 percent. And so you have to think about that. You never want to mix that money um, and um, those assets together. Um, so I always recommend um, that to my clients. And then I also think, even though you know they might be recently married, have young children, you know you have to think down the line for re um, adding what we would call uh, remarriage protections. So you know, God forbid, you know you pass away, and then your um, surviving your spouse, who's you know the survivor of the relationship, wants to get remarried. How do you protect your children and make sure that the assets that you have either worked really hard for or your parents have really worked hard for really go to those children? Um, so making sure that you have provisions in the trust that address that. 
Um, and then also, you know, just making sure that, um, you know, if you do get remarried later on, that you do change your beneficiary designations. And Allison, we're, we're talking a little bit about marriage. Let's, let's, and I'm by no means any sort of tax person, but I, I understand there's something called uh, married filing separately versus a joint filing. Can you maybe give a brief overview as to when that would apply and why uh, folks would, would think about either option? And, and does that exist now with the new tax act? Because I can't remember the answer to that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, if I could change anything about tax law, well, I change a lot of things. <laughs> uh, but one thing I would definitely get rid of is this sort of antiquated idea that we should combine tax situations with each other when we get married. They, it's, it's hard enough to combine financial situations. I know Chloe can speak to that. It's hard enough to combine legal situations. I know Cherish can speak to that. Um, but, you know, I have a number of clients who are married and um, have had issues combining their financial situation. But then I tell them, oh, well, unless you want a really bad tax answer, you're going to need to combine your financial situation simply to file tax returns together. That's very problematic, especially when one spouse has a business and the other one doesn't and withholdings and estimated tax payments and all that get very confusing on the other hand I have a number of clients who live together have lived together for a long time um, in a, a partnership and are not married and so they don't have the opportunity to file jointly which um, a lot of times can hurt them um, but a lot of times can present opportunities again if one person's a business owner one's not maybe they can uh, one can employ the other and shift some income around to uh, push income to someone in a lower tax bracket it's really it's really a frustrating situation for a lot of folks because just these days just because you're married doesn't mean that you share a financial situation and because you're unmarried doesn't mean you don't and let, let, let's follow up on that statistically people are getting married later we have a lot of same sex or same gender marriages but we also find a lot of people living together in some combination where they're not married and, and, and how does one think about tax planning when you're not married? Well, I'll give you one example. Um, I have uh, a couple of clients. They've lived together for a number of years. Um, they, they're both men, and they've been realized that, oh, marriage is now on the table. Do we want this or not? And so they're still exploring that. Um, but um, in the meantime, they've got a, a piece of property that, that they've owned and lived in for a number of years. Um, and there is, if and I'm sure probably everybody in this room is familiar, maybe our listeners are not, with the so-called 121 gain exclusion, which is your best friend in tax. And it says if you sell your house and uh, you have a gain on your house sale, as long as you meet certain requirements, you can exclude up to $250,000 of gain uh, from being taxed. That jumps to $500,000 if you're married. So, you know, for them, I said, okay, you know, I, I would love for you guys to get married if that's what you want, but you need to talk to me first so we can plan for your house sale. You know, I don't want them to uh, sell first and then get married later and then, you know, kind of get hosed there on the, the tax break. So that would just be one example. Well, we answered that question kind of from the planning perspective. You are an unmarried couple and you're living together for a while. You may not yet have decided for it to be a permanent relationship. Maybe you have. What difference is there for planning for an unmarried couple versus a married couple? Yes, it, I, I do have also some clients that, that have been in long-term relationships and are not married. And um, it, it's really a matter of, with, from a cash flow perspective, figuring out you know, what your joint goals are um, as a household and, and figuring out if you, how much you want to combine. Some people do set up joint accounts you know, just as if they were married, um, just to cover just the household expenses. Um, and things for the, the household and then keep everything else separate um, and some people just keep things completely separate uh, but but it really just depends on you know the relationship and and their specific goals cherish let me let's circle back to something you mentioned before which i didn't want to pass which was beneficiary designations and it occurs to me that a lot of young couples with young children they get the form from the bank the brokerage firm whatever it is and they say you know who's your beneficiary oh we'll list you know junior who is you know two. seven two. years <laughs> old too yes uh is that a good idea no so but often that's the best money manager in the family <laughs> <laughs> perhaps um so no and so there's this misconception out there 
that if you list a minor, your, your child, um, that they're able to get that money. Um, and, and they're not. So, you know, minors should never be listed on beneficiary designations. So what, what happens if, you know, the, the brokerage firm, the life insurance company, they pay the money to who's, who's listed? What, what happens then? So the parents or the surviving um, parent will have to um, what we call a conservatorship. So we have to, as their attorney, I would have to petition the court, ask for the, um, the court to set up a conservatorship, which means basically you're asking the court to manage the finances, um, uh, pick someone to manage the finances. Uh, conservatorships um, uh, cost a lot of money. Um, in the thousands of dollars. Um, so let's just say you had a small estate. It doesn't make sense for that to do that. And also the court is choosing who that conservator is. And they also require you, uh, the person who's going to be the conservator, the person who's going to take care of the money for the child, to um, be issued a bond, which is basically insurance policy so that that person won't run off with the money. It takes months. It can be complicated and time consuming so you never ever ever want to list a minor as a beneficiary i've seen it I, i've seen oh, that happen. It yeah time. and 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 it, it's just this misconception out there so if there's one takeaway today do not list a minor <laughs> as Amen. a beneficiary uh, uh, other than my children <laughs> 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 uh, we're listening today to wealth matters the radio show where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth we are your hosts today, Robert Port and Craig Frankel from the fiduciary litigation law firm of Gaswood Frankel. We're talking today with Chloe Moore with Financial Staples, Cherish de la Cruz with the La Cruz Law, and Allison McLeod with Atlanta Tax. And we're talking about financial and estate planning for young adults. Let's follow up a little on, on for children um, when you talk about minors being, being beneficiaries. I do want to highlight that with a conservatorship, it's over at 18. So if you have a 17-year-old child and you listed them, even if there's a conservatorship, they get access to money right away. Are there ways to use beneficiary designations where the money will politely be e given out at different times, whether it be a trust or something else? Is that possible as a designation? Yes. So you can name a trust as a um, part of the beneficiary designation. Um, as you know, children are getting older, some, some children are not responsible at 18. And so if you start thinking about the parent's estate and how many assets, let's just say you had a couple of million dollars, do you really want um, Junior to get that money? Um, I personally, I have three children, I wouldn't want that because I know that they would spend it on a brand new Lamborghini or something else. And so you can structure it in a trust so that it's either staged, you can give it to them um, during certain conditions, if you graduate from college, if you go to graduate school, whatever provisions you want, you can add that to the trust. Allison, I have a kind of an odd question for you. Let's go shift, for it. I get odd questions all day long. Let's shift gears. So, so one of the things that young people are going to be doing when they don't have children is they're going to be starting businesses. Absolutely. And they're going to be taking probably greater financial risk, and that's a good time to do it. Are there any kind of tax savings or, or things that uh, young people can use under the new tax act that might be something we haven't thought of? Well, I have to think about under the new tax laws, but I, I can tell you a few things. One thing that I recommend anyone starting a business, whether they're starting from scratch or whether they're buying a business, is uh, first make sure they have a very good corporate attorney. Uh, they need to look over any and all documents, um, help generate documents, that sort of thing. Also, make sure you're starting out with a good accountant, someone who will keep your financials for you, work with you on understanding those if business is not necessarily your background. Uh, both of those are definitely worth the money. So that's one of the, the best things I can offer. Um, on the tax side, definitely make sure you structure your business um, in a tax efficient way to begin with. Sometimes it's kind of hard to go from one tax entity to another. Uh, and you may find later down the road that uh, the tax structure you thought was great because, you know, everybody's doing it didn't help you at all because your situation is unique to you and you needed something tailored for you. And, and I want to underscore something you said when you talked about the corporate attorney. What you're talking about is creditor protection. What you don't want to do is all of your personal assets to be lost because the business doesn't quite go the way you want it. 
Yeah, that's certainly one one of the, the benefits and probably one of the bigger benefits of working with a corporate attorney. I think another one, um, it, and I see this all the time, is the ownership problems. Uh, when you just, when you start a business or buy a business and you're the only owner, you don't think about that. But when you say, oh, well, I want my mom to be involved. I want my brother to be involved. I want my two best friends from college to be involved. You will have problems. And working with a corporate attorney from the onset, they are going to ask you all the exit related questions that you didn't even think about. You know, what happens if another business partner becomes incapacitated or something like that? Like, what are you going to do? You would not have even thought to ask these things to yourself. Um, so good fences make good neighbors. Your operating agreement will be structured in a way that um, hopefully everybody walks away from the table a little bit unhappy. Um, and that ultimately long term will make everybody, hopefully will help make everybody happy. Or you may even realize that the person sitting across from you that you thought you were about to start a business with, it's not going to work. And you know on the front end, and that is money well, well spent. Right. And and one, one thing that we realize as attorneys is, is that the type of documents you're talking about, an operating agreement, a partnership agreement, a shareholders agreement, they can provide a roadmap yes. for disentangling people. And many times, just like marriage, folks get into business, everything's going to be great, 50-50, whatever it is, uh, and things don't often work out well. Uh, and then when there's no documents, we as attorneys are left with debates about what the intent was and what happened and how right. come you got more than me. You're trying to unscramble an egg. Stuff. That's right. right. So, Chloe, let, let me change the topic just a little bit. Well, a lot, maybe. Um, one of the things, one of the financial issues that, that, again, people sort of think of and many people say yuck is insurance. Talk about what you like to see or recommend for clients vis-a-vis -vis the range of insurance? Yes, um, so I'd say the, the most important thing to start with is um, I'd say the life and health and disability. Uh, for, young, for young clients who are, are married or have kids, um, there's definitely an insurance need there for life insurance uh, to take care of their families. Uh, for young professionals, the, the biggest asset that you have is your ability to earn income. And, and so a lot of people forget about disability insurance, especially when you're a business owner. Um, that's something that a lot of people just forget um, to, to insure themselves uh, for their ability to earn income if something were to happen to them uh, through an accident or illness. Um, and, so and my recollection is the statistics are that you're more likely to be disabled and unable to work than, than actually pass away. Correct. Correct. Yeah, so that's, that's something that um, even if your employer provides uh, disability insurance, in some cases, depending on your, your income level and, and your, your type, the type of work that you do, uh, it's, it's definitely good to have supplemental coverage as well. And, and Allison, explain a difference to our listeners. There's a difference between, for taxes, for employer-provided um, disability insurance versus buying it on your own that I, that I think might be significant. Yes, and I've, I've certainly seen this play out on the the inside of things um, unpleasantly so um, you know if you if you have life insurance uh, when that's paid out generally the recipients aren't taxed on that um, disability insurance can play out two different ways you're you may be taxed on the payments you receive um, uh, in your disability or you may not and that depends on whether the premiums were deducted on the front end so anything that's paid for by your employer they're going to deduct is just a fringe benefit to you so you know you may not even think about it and this goes to Chloe's point of, of, of pursuing supplemental insurance is you know maybe it was so cheap for for your employer to cover you under their disability policy and that's great at least you have something but when those payments come to you they'll be taxable where Whereas if you have a supplemental policy as an employee or just your own uh, long-term disability policy as a business owner, uh, as long as you don't deduct those payments on the front end, which I would never advise anybody to do, um, then then in the payout, then those those payments aren't taxed to you. And that's, that's huge. It's definitely worth paying the tax on the premiums now um, in case you ever want that tax-free money later because you, you will need it. You will go through it quickly. You don't want to be paying any more tax than you have to in that situation. So we are nearing the end of our show, so this is the fun part for me. So I'm going to ask each of you, you've got about 30 seconds, you have a captive 27-year-old who is thinking about getting married but has not yet gotten married. You've got 30 seconds to give them advice. Cherish, what's your advice? 
Definitely keep your assets separate um, if you can. Have an advanced health care directive and a will um, spelling out your wishes and then um, also have a financial power of attorney. Chloe, what's your advice? Uh, my advice would be communicate, communicate, <laughs> uh, especially when it comes to, to financial matters and relationship matters. Uh, I, I think that's there's a lot of conflict with, with financial Okay, when you say communicate and communicate, uh, tell us how one actually does that. <laughs> uh, well, for, for my clients who are married, I, I encourage money dates and, and just to talk about uh, just, you know, your that household. That sounds romantic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, money date is, oh gosh, we don't have any money. <laughs> But, but Preferably the over wine. That's disgusting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's always good to to have an understanding of of your joint goals, your values, um, what you're spending, and and just making sure that the household is running smoothly from a financial perspective. Okay, Allison, we're talking about values now. What is your advice? Uh, that one's really easy. Uh, I'll I'll talk to a new client who is recently widowed, <coughs> widowered, if that's a word, um, or just for whatever reason is now responsible for taking care of their tax situation, and they've not done that in the past. And it can be very confusing and overwhelming, especially in light of other things they may be going through. So my advice to folks who are getting married or are married uh, to the extent that it, it works for your relationship, try to approach your tax situation as partners. You know, it's okay to delegate pieces of your tax situation, but come together and really understand it. Again, it is the biggest financial hit to your household. It's the biggest hit to your long-term wealth. So, you know, don't, don't abdicate to one partner your entire tax situation. So my advice um, to our listeners is when you start thinking and you start getting your first job, Call professionals to give you advice. Amen. So, so if somebody wanted to call you, Allison, where would they? How would they get in touch with you? That's easy. I'm at Atlanta. Dot tax. And Chloe, how would they get in touch with you? Yes, my website is financialstaples.com, and all of my contact information is there. Excellent. And Cherish, my uh, website is a. Uh, www.delacruz, D-E-L-A-C-R-U-Z dash law.com. Well, thank you. As we're wrapping up our show, I want to thank everyone for listening to Wealth Matters, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. For more information about Gaslitz Frankel, please go to our website at gaslitzfrankel.com. And remember to follow us on Twitter at A State Dispute and you are, use our show's hashtag, Wealth Matters. Our guests today were Chloe Moore, CFP, Principal and CEO of Financial Staples, Cherish Dela Cruz, attorney and partner at Dela Cruz Law, LLC, and Allison McLeod, CPA and CFP at Atlanta Tax. Please join us every fourth Wednesday of the month at 8.30 a.m. here at Wealth Matters on Business Radio X. (laughs) 